So when you have um, things like metals and other types of elements, you can analyze them well with these instruments like inductively coupled plasma that we mentioned earlier. But when it's just carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen stuff, this basic um, organic stuff, the most common way to analyze it is combustion. It's called combustion analysis. And we'll talk about combustion reactions uh, in the next chapter. But what combustion means is reaction with oxygen. And it's generally involved in like burning things. So something burns, it combusts. But the real chemical definition is just full reaction with oxygen. So you put something in there. You put your C, X, H, Y, O, Z, you know, whatever compound in there. And you react it with a bunch of oxygen. Does anybody know what those products are? Yeah, you're going to get water and carbon dioxide. The handy thing about that is that you've now separated the hydrogen and the carbon into two molecules and you can measure them individually. So using this we can do what we just did before. We can actually figure out how much hydrogen and how much carbon was in the original material and then get an, an empirical formula. The difference with combustion analysis is it takes just one extra step because we don't know exactly the amount of hydrogen and carbon. We know the amount of water and carbon dioxide. And then we have to calculate the, number, the amount of hydrogen and carbon. So let's do an example um, of that and talk about how this works. All right. So a, a problem might look something like this. A 0.8233. Gram sample produced upon combustion two point four four five grams of CO2 and 0 0.6003 grams of water. Okay, find the find the empirical formula. Okay. Now the confounding part of this is that a bunch of that mass is due to an extra oxygen that wasn't part of your original. The previous problems we did if you got some masses, you used those masses to figure out the moles and all that, and it was good. Now we have some extra oxygen to deal with. So we have to first find the moles of carbon dioxide and water, and then find the moles of actually carbon and hydrogen. Okay, So let's do that. Moles of CO2 is going to be 2.445 divided by 44.4 um, we have those numbers here and that's going to be 0 0.05556 moles okay and then we'll do the same thing with water And we get 0.0. So now we have moles of carbon dioxide and water. How do we figure out moles of carbon and hydrogen? Yeah, so like how many moles of carbon are in 
that many moles of carbon dioxide? The same amount, right? We, we discussed that earlier. So that's going to be that many moles of carbon. And then how many moles of hydrogen are in that many moles of water? Double that, right? So 0 0.06662 moles of hydrogen. Because there are two moles of hydrogen for every one mole of water. That's the little H2 part. OK. Now, if, it were, if the original sample were just made of carbon and hydrogen, we could go to the next step that we did before and divide these by the smaller one and get a ratio. But we don't have that here. This uh, material also contains oxygen. So we have to figure out how much leftover, how much oxygen is there that we haven't accounted for. And the way we do that is to back calculate the mass now from the moles, from these moles. All right. And he, uh, so this may not make sense until we sort of get to the end of it, but I'm going to lay it out here. We're going to say that. This many moles of carbon are times 12 grams per mole of carbon, or 12.011, whatever, is going to be this many grams of carbon. Okay? And then we're going to do the same thing with hydrogen. Now the reason we did that, so I'm actually going to kind of put this in brackets, unfinished brackets, because we've got a little more to do. Because like I said, if it were only carbon and hydrogen, these are the only moles we would need to worry about, and we could go on and divide and get our empirical formula. Yeah? Since you did two moles of hydrogen on the top part, would you do um, two grams for hydrogen also? No, because in this case, we're only looking at moles of hydrogen to grams of hydrogen. So that we're just using the, the molar mass there. We're not looking at it in a particular compound, necessarily. OK, so here's why we did that. We can now add these two numbers up and subtract them from the total amount. So you had. this many grams in your sample, and we're going to subtract the grams of hydrogen and the grams of hydrogen, carbon, I'm sorry, and the grams of hydrogen. Okay, And that's going to get us to 0 0.0889 grams, sort of leftover unaccounted for grams. So what do you think that those came from? Though that's the oxygen. So that's how we found the mass of oxygen. And that's the only way we can do it that now, is to go back and subtract. All right, so we did all that. Now we need to add another line here where we figure out the moles of oxygen before we can put it all together. So we've got 0 0.0889 grams of oxygen 
times sixteen grams per mole oxygen equals I'll keep my color scheme here zero point zero zero five five six moles of oxygen. Yes. That is the total that we started with. The total mass of the sample. Okay, no, that's fine, thanks. All right, so now we have the three moles, which is what we need to actually figure out this formula the same way we did before. So you divide them all together. Right? You divide them all by the smallest one, which in this case is which? Oxygen. The oxygen, 0 0.00556. And you get in this case, very even numbers. So 0 0.05556 divided by 0 0.0556 is about 10. So that means it's going to be C10. Do the same thing with hydrogen. And you get 12. So that means it's H12. And then, of course, oxygen divided by itself is going to be 1. So our empirical formula is C10H12O or O1. OK? So that was the same process as what we did before with one extra step, well, two extra steps. We had to get the carbon and the hydrogen from the carbon dioxide and the water, and then we had to get the extra stuff from that little subtraction um, in the middle there. Um, this is a, these problems and the previous ones are the sort of thing that you'll just practice and then it'll not be see, seem quite as crazy and difficult. So there are a bunch of problems like this in the back of that chapter. Just do them one by one. Go back to this as an example. You can go back and watch this video from class today and, uh, and do it until you're comfortable with it. And I think you'll be OK. Um, all right. So questions about those problems? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in this case. You, had, you were dealing with a bunch of significant figures, so I just threw in a couple more. No. No. No, I should have kept it that way all around. So like, let, let's correct it. This should be 12.01. And this should be uh, 1.0. Uh, we should keep it, you should keep it with these types of calculations as many significant figures as you can the whole way through so that your numbers come out rounding up nicely. Otherwise, they might not. Yeah, when you're picking numbers off the periodic table, you should pick them to match your significant figures. OK. So that was an example of a chemical equation. And this is going to be important for a lab on Monday, talking a little bit about chemical equations. Now, you've probably seen some of these before. Just things that make a chemical change. You've got H2 and O2, and they form H2O. Methane and oxygen, carbon dioxide and water. That's combustion. Uh, sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid, water and sodium chloride. That's an acid-base reaction. We're going to talk about all these types of things. Um, a few general, general tips that you've probably heard before. 
Reactants are on the left. Those are the things that you put on, put in. Products are on the right, the things that they make. Uh, and this change is called the chemical reaction. But the expression of this change in that form with the arrow in the middle is called the chemical equation. Right. So bonds are broken, bonds are, bonds are formed, atoms aren't created or destroyed. That's the law of the conservation of mass. And because of that law of conservation of mass, we need to have the proper mass balance on both sides of the equation. So let's look back up at these. Let's look at the first one. What's wrong with the first equation there? Sorry. What's wrong with that first equation? Oxygen, yeah. According to that equation, in this reaction, an atom of oxygen just disappeared. Okay, And we know that that doesn't happen. We can make bonds, we can break bonds, but we can't make matter simply disappear. So that can't be right. What about the next one? What? Yeah, there's a problem with hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen, again, has disappeared in this, according to this equation. We went from four on the left to just two on the right. What else? Oxygen. An oxygen atom appeared out of nowhere, out of the ether of the world, and entered our reaction. So that's not right either. And then what about the third one? Yeah, third one matches up. We've got two hydrogens on the left, two on the right. One oxygen on the left, one on the right. A sodium on the left, one on the right. A chlorine on the left, one on the right. So that one, that one works out. OK. So now we're going to talk about balancing those equations. Well, OK, we're not going to do it officially. But let's go back up and, and do this. What do we need in that first one? to get it balanced. Yeah, we need to get, well, yes, but we need more oxygen on the, on the right side is what we need, right? Can we, can we do this? Why not? That's now a different product. Okay, that tells us it's not a water molecule anymore. It's a hydrogen peroxide molecule. It's a molecule with two oxygens and two hydrogens in it. So we can't do that. Um, so we can go like this, though, right? This tells us we have two molecules or two moles of water. Ah, and now we have too many hydrogen on the right, so we have to fix that over here. Okay. Now is that equation balanced? Yes. It is. We have the same number of atoms on the left as on the right. OK. We'll, we'll come back and try this again. But let's talk a little bit about uh, the meaning of the chemical e equation. We get a lot, of, uh, a lot of information from this. And it's really important to write them and, and see them. And you'll, you know, even not being chemists, if you decide not to be chemists, which I don't think any of you will, you'll probably all be chemists. But uh, <laughs> if you decide not to, you'll probably still see chemical equations in various ways in the future. Um, it tells you the nature of the reactants and the products. What are they? What atoms are they made out of? It tells you the relative numbers. And then we also tell, say, say something about the nature of the state of that. So is it a solid, S, liquid L, gas G, or aqueous, AQ, which means it's something that's dissolved in water. OK. So here's an example of a chemical equation with all that stuff. So th it tells us that we are putting HCl and NaHCO3, which is hydrochloric acid and Sodium bicarbonate, right. Together, it also tells us the HCl, the hydrochloric acid, is dissolved in water. And the sodium bicarbonate is a solid. That's what the little s means. And it also tells us that when that happens, they form carbon dioxide, which is a gas, water, which is a liquid, pure liquid, and sodium chloride in aqueous solution, meaning sodium chloride that is dissolved in water. OK. Is that balanced? It is in this case, yeah. So let's try balancing some equations. Um, I assume you've done some of this before in previous chemistry classes, but rules. 
Don't break these rules. The formulas of the compounds must never be changed. That's what we tried to do before. Don't mess with the bottom numbers. You can't mess with the bottom numbers. Just remember, can't mess with the bottom numbers. Um, and then the second part is we generally balance by inspection, systematic trial and error. A lot of equations will be simple enough that you can just say, oh, we need some more of that one, so let's get some more of that one. Done. Okay. There's no need to go through big fancy algorithms for most of these. Um, and then when you do need to go through some things, some step by step, always start with the, ad with the molecule with the most atoms. Because that's the one that's going to affect the most of the rest of the equation. And if you mess with that one first, you can use the other ones to sort of balance it out. Okay. When you get a chemical reaction and you want to express it through a chemical equation, here's what you do. You determine the reaction that's occurring. What are the reactants' products? What are their physical states? You write an unbalanced equation, and then you balance it. All right, so here's some practice. This is a chemical reaction described in words. We are going to describe it in a chemical equation. During respiration by plants and animals, a carbohydrate, glucose, C6H12O6, reacts with oxygen to produce water and carbon dioxide. So what are the reactants? What are the things that are reacting? Glucose and oxygen. And what is the state of glucose, do you think? It's a solid, but in a plant, in respiration, it's probably actually in a solution. Yeah, if it were put in by itself, it would be a solid. Um, and then this reacts with oxygen, which is what? Oxygen is a gas, yeah. And produces water, which is a liquid and carbon dioxide, which is another gas. Okay, so we've described the reaction through an equation. Is it balanced? So how do you balance it? What, how, what would you start with here? Well, the first thing to do, I guess, sorry, I'll answer. Um, is just figure out what isn't balanced. Oxygen. The oxygens aren't balanced. The hydrogens aren't balanced. Carbons are the balance. Right, so everything's out of whack here. What molecule are you going to start with? Glucose. Yeah, you're going to start with the big complex one, glucose. It's got six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens. So we don't want to change that too much if we can, because every time we change the quantity of that, we have to rebalance all the carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens. So starting with that, where would you first try to balance? Yeah, or carbon. Um, so either way here, our first atoms that we're going to try to balance are either hydrogen or carbon. Why is that? Why not oxygen first? It's in too many places. Yeah, it's in too many places. It's in all the different molecules. So it's going to be too tricky to try to balance how many numbers of each to put in there. We know the carbons and the hydrogens are in, in uh, just, a, just one on each side. So let's, let's start with hydrogens. You got 12 on this side and 2 on this side. So what do you do to balance those out? Yep, we're going to have six water molecules. That gives us 12 total hydrogen atoms. And then let's do the carbon. How many carbons? You got six here, one here. So what do you do? Six, six of those, right. OK. And now, uh, last, we'll balance the oxygens. So we've got uh, 18 on this side, right? And eight on this side. So how do we balance that? Yep, you need six of those. Okay. So now we've got 18 on each side. And always double check it at the end. Six carbons, six carbons, 12 hydrogens, 12 hydrogens, uh, 18 oxygens, 18 oxygens. Okay, these, uh, this next page, I want you to try these on your own or within your group and see what you come up with. All 
All right, let's look at some of these. Um, first one I think was fairly simple, maybe. Methane gas is destroyed by reaction with hydroxyl radical to produce methyl radical and water. Okay, this one I had a couple questions about. In the stratosphere, nitrous oxide can react with high energy oxygen atoms to produce nitric oxide. So what's nitrous oxide? How do you know? Or maybe how can you guess? Let's, let, let's see what we do know. What? Nothing feels right with this one? I'm sorry. So there's NO. It's also a gas. And we're reacting with oxygen atoms. It's oxygen atoms, not oxygen molecules, actually, in this case, because it's really high energy. It's un really unusual. What do you think? Let's think about it this way. Does nit Based on what you know from what I wrote down, from what we got from this text, does nitrous oxide have to have a smaller nitrogen oxygen ratio or a bigger nitrogen oxygen ratio than nitric oxide? Smaller. Why smaller? Well, yes, there's that, but you can get that just from the equation. You're adding oxygen. So nitrous oxide must be oxygen deficient relative to nitric oxide. Otherwise, you could never get it to balance because you're essentially saying here's something with more um, oxygen, and then we add more oxygen, and then we have something with less oxygen. That can't work, right? So, um, like, let's say that you thought nitrous oxide was NO2. Okay. You could never get this to balance, right? There's always going to be more oxygen on the left than on the right. So that can't be right. It's got to be something with less oxygen than NO. And that fits our prefixes as well. If you remember, nitric oxide, think about nitric acid versus nitrous acid. Nitric acid has more oxygen in it than nitrous acid. So in fact, nitrous oxide is N2O. I have a question. Yes? Isn't it actually supposed to be denitrous oxide? Yes. In, this is a molecular compound, and it should be named as dinitrogen monoxide. Um, however, a lot of these things often take older names, and that's this is an example of that. Okay. So, you know, nitrous oxide is still called nitrous oxide pretty much everywhere, even though um, by the rules its name should be dinitrogen monoxide. Yeah, you're right. Okay, carbon dioxide dissolves in water to yield carbonic acid. Carbonic acid then partially dissociates. So, what is this telling you about this one that's a little bit different? It's two reactions. This thing happens, then this thing happens. So let's look at the first one. Carbon dioxide dissolved in water to yield carbonic acid, which is what? H2CO3, and that's still in solution. Carbonic acid then partially dissociates to produce the hydrogen carbonate anion, also known as the bicarbonate anion, and the hydrogen cation. All right. Now, we haven't dealt with balancing, actually. I forgot about that. Uh, this one, number three, how do we balance that? You need two of these, right? And what about number four? Number four is balanced. We're good. OK, and then here comes the tricky one. Hydrocarbons, CnH2n plus 2, react with oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water. So how do you balance that if you don't have an actual number? What? 
you could pick some and kind of do it by inspections, but let's see if we can do it totally generally and see if it works. For instance, we have n carbons on the left. So how many carbons do we need on the right? n. OK. Now let's balance the hydrogens. Why the hydrogens next? Because the oxygens are in too many things again, right? So we've got 2n plus 2 over here. How many waters then do we need to balance that? What? Well, whatever we put in front is going to be multiplied by 2 and needs to equal 2n plus 2. So what do we put in front? 1n n plus 1. N plus 1, thanks. Right? Because n plus 1 quantity times 2 is 2n plus 2. All right, so now it gets tricky. How many oxygens do we need on? Do we have on the right? On the right, we have 2n from here, right? Plus n plus 1 from here, which is 3n plus 1. So then how many do we need here to balance that? 3n plus 1 over 2. Right. All right. So that's a little tricky. Good, good algebra review. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. That's good. But this is sort of like, it's sort of like a, almost a, a general answer. Now, any hydrocarbon with the formula CnH2n plus 2, like, C3H8, you can get all the other substituents, or the, all the other coefficients just by plugging them into those formulas. What is so the formula? Oh, that's O. Oh. Well, can we, can we do yeah. it? Oh, okay. Just pick the N to be 1 and then do it this way? Yes, as long as you can then get it back into N form. Uh, there was another question that I, somebody I interrupted. Yes. Number three? Yeah. Is there the oxygen, the oxygen is Right. Usually, let's talk about that because that's going to come up a bit more. Uh, diatomic atoms. So if you look at the periodic table, you got hydrogen off on its own again, and then nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine all come in pairs. And when we talk about bonding, we'll learn why that is. But they all come in as a diatomic molecule, which means if you have a sample of oxygen, it's not O atoms, it's O2. Right? If you have a sample of hydrogen, it's not hydrogen atoms individually, it's H2 molecules. So that's true for that. I don't know, people have different ways of, of remembering it. There's some kind of saying or something. I don't remember what it is. Somebody said it last year. I always think of it as you got hydrogen, and then you have this, I think of it as like a shape. Tetris thing or something. Um, so which one's hydrogen? Hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine. You can think of it as a, I don't know, a seven or a backwards gamma or something. Um, okay, so when those come up, uh, anyway, so to go back to your question, in this case, it's actually reacting with individual atoms because it's a high energy situation. It's specified. In any other situation where it said reacts with oxygen, we assume it's O2. OK. Uh, denitrification in soils and oceans occurs when nitrate ion, which is what? NO3 minus? Just minus 1 is reduced to nitrous oxide by anaerobic bacteria in the presence of water. Oxygen gas and the hydroxide ion are also produced during this process. Is that balanced? Uh, what do you want to balance first? Sure. How do you balance hydrogen? 
Right, we need two hydroxides to balance with the two H's from the water on the other side. What should we balance next? Nitrogen? Okay, how do we do that? We need two of these. Now we have two nitrogens on each side. And then we count up all the oxygens and we have seven on the left and five on the right. So we need two more. So two of those will give us two more. Now we have seven on each side. All right. One more, and we'll leave the rest for homework. Nitrous oxide is not reactive in the troposphere. However, once it reaches the stratosphere, high energy photons are available to photolyze the nitrous oxide and produce nitric oxide and hydrogen atom. So what's going on here? Oh, yeah. So is that balanced? Yeah. Yep. One thing you also might see in chemical reactions is this. What's that? Green. That's light. That's light. We'll talk about this when we get into the quantum mechanics chapter, but light is often expressed as a photon. And the energy of a photon is given as H nu. That's not a V. It's a nu Greek letter. H is Planck's constant, which is a constant you can look up, and nu is the frequency of the light. So a lot of times this is a symbol that you'll see in a chemical reaction, meaning that something reacts with light or, phot or photons. All right. That's it.